Abundance is a noun, which means an extremely plentiful or oversufficient quantity or supply. And uh, certainly the definition of abundance is unique to each individual. And um, for me, I want to say that abundance for me is that each person in determining their abundance has to look at what, what they value. And for me, abundance means opportunity to connect, grow and make an impact. And language and literature has allowed me to do that. And I think it has the capacity to make each individual person, gives each individual person the opportunity to do the same. I, before I begin any further, I want to say that I will not be lecturing on the scholarly merits of language or giving you any sort of um, tip on the mechanics of creating literature yourself. I know you have some great teachers there and um, that they've already done that. So I'm sure that you are already aspiring in your own language and literature pursuits. So I, I tend to look at um, the world as a whole. And I like to think of us as individuals as a whole. And um, when I think about, um, or when I talk about language and literature, you will um, see that I speak about it on broader terms than earning a degree in the, in the field. Although I certainly think that's lovely when uh, people are so in love with language and words that that is their academic pursuit. Um, but I, I tend to think of it on a broader scale. That's because I believe that language and literature are happening everywhere. They're changing the world one word at a time. I see writers and poets everywhere. In fact, one of my favorite poets, or really my favorite poet, is a singer and songwriter who lost his life to COVID this spring. John Prine is someone who's been a friend through his music. He's not someone I know personally, but because I've grown up listening to his music um, and hearing what he had to say about the human condition, he touched me in ways that others uh, have not. Certainly, I, I'm sure you read Henry Wadsworth, Longfellow, Ralph Waldo, Mizra Ghalib, Rabindranath Tagore. They're all famous poets. John Prine is a famous singer, but very few people think of him as a poet. I do think of him as my favorite poet. And as you read his words here, we are the lonely all together, all together, we're all alone. That speaks so deeply to the human condition and um, to human humans as we are. And um, this is just one of many uh, song lyrics that he wrote. Another person um, who speaks to me is John Muir. He was a, um, basically an environmental um, advocate and well known in the US. I'm not sure that he's known outside the US, but um, he had something to say about our connection with nature. And I read his words, it's like reading literature. Um, it's beyond a story, but it is a story. And it connects, it makes me see his connection to nature and connects me with nature as well. Both John Prine and um, John Muir are just everyday fellows. Before he was discovered as a songwriter, John Prine was a postman. He delivered letters, <laughs> actually in the Chicago suburbs, not near me, but, and long before I lived here. But um, he was just an everyday fellow. And John Muir is, um, was the son of Scottish immigrants. He, his family, uh, 
fled to the U.S. to the state of Wisconsin, and they were farmers. But in working the soil and exploring the Wisconsin woods, John Muir became one of the greatest influences in, in modern history for our understanding and connection and relation to the environment. And uh, we, thankfully today there are more people who are connecting to the environment and understanding the reasons that we need to take care of it. But he was a pioneer in that area. Neither of these people were quote unquote literary writers, but they were people who had impact on the world. And so I just want to say that every time you pick up a book, read an article, hear a song, or read any words that someone has written, just like the introduction that you all put together. Um, it's an opportunity to connect. It's someone doing exploration, either within themselves, within their imagination, within the facts, within old papers, whatever they're doing, and inviting you to connect and to be a part of their world for a little while. And when you write, that's what you're doing, whether you know it or not. <laughs> so, um, I hope that you can see the number of characters that you've been introduced to um, so far in this presentation. I'm one of them. And the people who introduced me are, and then I've introduced you to a couple of new people. And we're all inviting connection. And so again, I feel that abundance is our connection one to another. I often say <clears throat> that I read to discover myself. Um, the book Different Seasons is a, is a collection of four novellas written by Stephen King, someone who doesn't get a lot of um, acclaim from the literary critics, although he sells millions of books. Um, and when I first read his story, The Body, um, in 1986, I was leaving my parents' homes, home. I had grown up in a very rural area uh, and had gone to, to a university that wasn't that big. It certainly wasn't even nearly the size of your school at all. And um, it was a transition time. For me. And so this book uh, or this novella, I picked it up and the first words of the novella are here. I'll read them to you. Uh, you can read along with me. The most important things are the hardest to say. They are the things you get ashamed of because words diminish them. Words shrink things that seem limitless when they were in your head to no more than living size when they're brought out. But it's more than that, isn't it? The most important things lie too close to wherever your secret heart is buried, like landmarks to a treasure your enemies would love to steal away. And you may make revelations that cost you dearly only to have people look at you in a funny way, not understanding what you've said at all or why you thought it was so important that you almost cried while you were saying it. That's the worst, I think, when the secret stays locked within, not for want of a teller, but for want of an understanding ear. I was 12 going on 13 when I first saw a dead human being. It happened in 1960, a long time ago, although sometimes it doesn't seem that long to me especially on the nights I wake up from dreams where the hail falls into his open eyes. <clears throat> and there was something about that um, particular story when I, um, when I read it that made me, um, oh, 
I just saw. Uh, Dr. Gatakis, are my slides still stuck? Hello? Uh, Ma'am, you need to unmute your microphone. Yes, uh, sorry. Yes, your slide is still stuck, actually. It is still stuck in the first one. What is abundance? Oh, no. Thank you for telling me. I've been showing so many good things. <laughs> yes, we and and we are missing it all. Thus, uh, I wanted to okay. let you know, but couldn't just you know stop you in the middle of the talk. Just, all right, so I'm gonna um, stop the share. Thank you for letting me know, and then let's see. Let me try again. Thank you. I couldn't uh, see. Maybe one thing I can do. Hold on. Yes. There we go. How about now? Can you see the dictionary definition of abundance? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. So I'm not going to say everything again because you've already heard that much, but um, I will. Give me just a second. There we go. So this is just the slide that talked about the what I see as abundance. Then what does abundance mean for you? Then this is John Prine, who I was talking at length about. <laughs> um, he is uh, a singer songwriter who passed away this spring. Um, and then this was the uh, quote from John Moore that I wanted to share with you. In every walk with nature, one receives far more than he seeks. And in this slide, I was mentioning about how um, writers invite us to connect with them when we, and we connect with them as we pick up their books and their words. And then this is the book I was just <laughs> just reading from, uh, Stephen King's Different Seasons and the, the novella, The Body. Um, has anyone seen, uh, and I know that you probably can't uh, answer right away, but uh, if you've seen the movie, the Shawshank Redemption, it's an American movie. The novella for that movie is also in this book. And the body was made uh, was made into a movie called Stand by Me. So if you've seen either of those books, and this was what I just read, <laughs> I won't read it again unless you think I should. Um, uh, but it really spoke to me. It's this is where I was in that time of transition for me. This this uh, story is the story of four young boys who are just about to enter junior high school. So they were in a time of transition. And it's the summer and they um, have learned that one of their classmates has died and they go out into the woods looking for him. And um, the narrator of the story is a writer and there was just something about every word that was in this introduction that spoke to me in the first time I read it and every time I read it I find something else. Um, in the 86 I hadn't seen a dead body at that point but um, a few years later I would go to work as a journalist and um, I saw more than a dead body uh, as a result of the work that I did. And I, 
always came back to this compelling, especially on the nights I woke up from dreams where the hail falls into his open eyes. Uh, it's something that can't be unseen. And, um, and I related to, I, um, again, when I first read and so many other times during transitions in my life, this idea that I had something to say, but when I would try to say it, my words would never, maybe even like right now, <laughs> um, when I would try to say it, my ideas in my head were not as big as, um, I didn't mean to go this far back, but I'll just stay there. Um, the idea in my head was not big enough was so much bigger than what I could find the words to say. I love that. Words diminish them. And so words are really important, but finding the way to say them in a way that is compelling, that make them as large as they are, um, as they truly are, became sort of a lifeline for me to remember that, yes, this seems big in your head, but you have to find a way when you're writing to say it in a way that it captures someone else's attention. So um, next I wanted to, first I'm just gonna check, are the slides advancing now? I just wanna make sure they are. Any problems? There we go. Can you still see my screen? Yes. Yeah, okay. All right. So, um, based on what uh, Stephen King wrote in The Body, he said, <clears throat> when the secret stays locked within for not for want of a teller, but for want of an understanding ear, that was, that's one reason that we write. But I, but I also found um, that what he had to say related to um, Maya Angelou and her autobiography, <clears throat> I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. She says, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside of you, <clears throat> inside you. And I don't know if you have read this book, <clears throat> Excuse me. But um, it's the story of Maya Angelou, who certainly was seen a lot more favorably by the critics than Stephen King and is more revered as a classic writer. But when she was a young girl, she was molested and raped by her mother's live in um, boyfriend. And when she told about the rape, um, um, her mother's live-in boyfriend was taken to court. And when, the, when she testified, he was convicted. And later that day, he was brutally murdered. After that, she stopped speaking because she thought her tongue could kill. She thought she had, her tongue had the power to kill. And she stayed silent for a long, long time. She would talk to her brother, Bailey, um, but in her silence, she began to write poems because her, po her silence was killing her inside. It was creating great agony, as she said. And finally, one day she had a teacher who convinced her. She had started to turn the poems in for, for schoolwork. And um, her teacher convinced her that the only way she was ever going to become better was if she spoke and read the poems aloud. And for the first time she spoke. And um, for those of you who may or may not know the history of Maya Angelou, before she died, she had received more than 50 honorary degrees. She had published numerous books of poetry and the most 
famous is I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, which is not poetry, but prose. And um, she had been given the Presidential Medal, Medal of Freedom. She definitely was and continues to be one of America's most beloved poets. So that voice inside um, that was locked up made such a difference in the way that she wrote. And it was in her pushing that out and connecting to herself and connecting to her feelings that she was able to bring something and a tremendous impact into the world. Now you may be thinking, where's my voice? <laughs> I've never had an experience like that. Will I ever achieve a claim as a writer? Possible you won't. And if you don't, won't it be wonderful that you didn't have to endure something horrific in order to find that voice? But if you have endured something, it's something worth writing about. And you do have a voice that already has an abundant cast of characters. So, um, drawing on what you know and what you already have known um, about literature and language and yourself, most of all. That's the key. Um, I'd like to pause here and do a little exercise. Um, I think everybody who's coming should be in the room. So, so um, I'll tell you first that a little bit about the exercise. Carl Jung was a um, student of Sigmund Freud and he was um, a renowned um, psychoanalyst and psychiatrist and psychologist, sorry, not psychiatrist. And um, he had a belief, he called it individualization. Individ it's a hard word to say, individuation. And basically the concept was that um, rather than a single personality, individual personality, we are um, of all our differentiations of self. That's a little bit hard to wrap your head around. But from his work, a woman named Julia Cameron, a poet and writer who wrote the book, The Artist Way, which is used by writers all over the globe to connect with themselves on a daily basis, writing morning pages, um, developed this exercise I was fortunate enough to do the exercise with Julia Cameron and I'm, I'm going to enjoy doing it with you here today. Um, it was transformative for me because it helped me to see myself in a new light. And I'm hopeful that it will help you to find your voice as well. Um, <clears throat> so a little bit about the exercise. Basically, what this exercise is, is an opportunity, an invitation to you to meet yourself, your whole self, the individuations of yourselves. So um, what I'm going to ask you to do in a few moments is to consider your, your daily life, your personality, who you are, and to um, pull out a piece of paper and to begin to identify your personalities. Now you may be going, what is this woman talking about? I don't understand. So I'm gonna introduce you to my uh, personalities. It, it almost sounds like, um, sounds like um, multiple personality disorder, but I assure you it's not. This is all a part of who I am. And it's a part of what I draw on when I write, when I think, and when I read. So um, these are five of my individual personifications. Um, I'll tell you, I'll read them to you. I've given them names and I'd like for you to give yours names, but you may not have time today, but 
There's Miss Sassy Pants, and I don't know if that's a familiar term uh, for you all, but Miss Sassy Pants is uh, sometimes mothers call their kids that. <laughs> um, I call my most adult self that because she's very sassy. She's the person who's in charge. She's the one that's going to keep everything in order. She's highly critical of herself. She's a task mask master. She makes all these long lists and checks them off. And um, she is her own worst critic and um, her best cheerleader. And then um, there's traveling Trudy. She's curious. She loves to be free, um, wears comfy clothes, is always looking for something new, some new adventure. Let's go. Let's keep going. She's been pretty uh, quiet during COVID lockdown. Let's just put it that way. Um, then there's Mother Earth. And um, that's the part of me that is very nurturing, organized, wise, loving, the person that friends want to come to and hear from. She loves to wear roomy dresses and comfy shoes and she dresses in cotton and um, loves to be outdoors. Um, and then there's colorful Cammy, and she's carefree, creative, loves to laugh, loves to be out on a Friday night listening to live music. She's very lively. She might have made these slides. I don't know. <laughs> and then there's Inner Egrid. She's very dark and depressive and sad. And she's thoughtful and analytical. She's pretty cynical. She watches movies that are can, that make her cry. She wears night clothes most of the time. So that's who she is. I'd like to just take a pause, just a few minutes, and ask you to take some time. To your personalities. Um, you can write four, you know, three, four, five, ten, whatever you come up with. Um, because these are your cast of characters, and this is what you draw from, and this creates your abundance. So if you would just take a few minutes, and we'll just take a, a pause here for that. So can they choose as many uh, characters as they would? And you may only have three. It's something new. It's a new way of thinking. So, I, you know, it's okay. But the way I like to look at it is I have a professional side. I have a side that I, um, a personality that I am when I'm alone. I have a personality with friends. I have a personality when I'm at work. Um, yes. I think maybe, um, what do you think? Three more minutes? Does that sound good? Yes, yes, yes. Good enough, and they can. Uh, we all can choose our first
Okay. Is there anyone who would be willing or would like to share about that that experience? If it um, anything you noticed as you were writing down your personality. Someone has uh, put in the chat, trapped kid watches Disney shows, crafts. <laughs> Oops, it went down. Crafts what? Oh. Yeah. Anyone want to? Yeah. Yeah, I was just asking them if they want to share anything else. Come on, surely someone developed a great character. I'm eager to hear you. I mean, I've been talking all this time. <laughs> <laughs> Right. We have a group of five people today. That's okay. That's all right. Thank you for participating. I hope it was useful. Um, I'll just uh, go forward. Um, what we've been talking about up until now um, has been mainly about what goes on in your head and the ways that language and literature can create abundance within your life. I'm going to start my screen share again. Um, now you maybe um, want to get down to the core question, <laughs> which is, how does this help me to develop my work future and my future as a, as a professional? From a purely vocational standpoint, I have to say I'm very envious of your generation. Um, when I started, the idea of being a writer, the only things there were um, in my mind were to be a journalist, which I became, to be a novelist, um, which I never wanted to become, <laughs> um, to be an editor, which I did did become. Um, but today the world is waking up to the wisdom and I have woken to the wisdom of what literature actually does mean. Um, studying literature and language and liberal arts actually does mean um, for the professional world, for the for organizations. Um, and among the um, hottest things on the work work uh, in the work world now is the idea of storytelling. And um, as this slide says, good communication has always been about the story you have to tell. And no matter what the field is, whether it's engineering, whether it's um, medicine, whether it is, you know, any sort of business, retail, everyone is looking for what's a story that can capture the attention of people in this busy world and cause them to pause. And um, this article says creating compelling, immersive, interactive, collaborative, cross-disciplinary plenary and community or team-based combinations of content and context is the only way forward. That was not something that I ever considered um, on a business level. I thought if you're a writer, you're um, the only thing that you can do is write or edit or um, create words, but that's not true anymore. In but what employers are looking for these days are effective communicators, people who can create words um, and put words together with precision, with clarity, and that are persuasive. They want influencers, storytellers, creatives, visionaries, people with big vision. And, and as people who read and understand language and literature, 
We are visionaries. We see the big picture. We're always looking for what's at the end of this story. What's at the end of this book? How did these characters work together to create this? Um, analytical thinkers, problem solvers. Within literature, we find all those answers. And finally, the business world is waking up and saying, we need these people. We need them in our boardrooms. We need them in our leadership. We need people who think more broadly. So how do you develop those desired skills? And I think you're all doing these now, but I'll go through them. You read voraciously, read whatever. And I, again, not just books, articles, um, songs, anything that has words, write, continue to write, write in ways that don't feel comfortable because what writing is, is shaping thought and shaping language and communicating. Edit and evaluate. Do that with other people's work. Do it with your own work. Create content. When in this other slide, I, you know, I sh shared cross-disciplinary, uh, collaborative, interactive. Those are all things that are content. They're not just words. That's the one thing that's different these days about um, language and how it's used. It's not just the words that are written. It's the visual, and there's a lot of lot of collaboration that goes on. Comparative analysis. I know when Dr. Gottick probably has you compare one piece of literature to another. That's teaching you skills that will take you forward in um, whatever you do with your professional life. Research and exploration, whatever interests you, go forward in, and explore it with great curiosity. Bill Gates recently said that the thing that sets other, sets truly great minds apart is a curiosity. And I think those who read and, and study language and literature are people who are curious and harness your imagination. I loved that um, the person who did share about the characters that they develop was very imaginative. And that imagination is what really captures other people's attention because they really get out of themselves. <clears throat> Just give me a second. Um, this, is, this is a quote from a, an author of a book called The New Education, How to Revolutionize the University to Prepare Students for a World in Flux. And uh, she's a, a professor at City University of New York. The humanities and the arts and the pleasure in studying them makes us not only work ready, but ready, but world ready too. And the world is in desperate need of the expertise of those who are educated to the human, cultural, and social, as well as the computational. And what um, the work world is discovering is something that you may not know. <laughs> and it was interesting for me to think about, but um, I know that Many of you likely have been encouraged to become engineers, <laughs> as uh, was said in the um, introduction. Um, some of the best engineers have come from India, and including my beloved husband. But what we read here, this is from the New, a New York Times article, engineers earn early, but liberal arts majors endure because they have those soft skills, problem solving, critical thinking, adaptability, that are hard to quantify, um, but, and they don't create clean pathways to high paying first jobs, but the long run value is in a wide variety of careers. So keep your options open and remember that you are the long-term winner. Um, this is just from another book that is, uh, has come out by a guy named George Anders, 
um, who wrote a book called You Can Do Any Surprising Power of a Useless Liberal Education, <laughs> uh, Liberal Arts Education. He And he in the book, he talks about how all these um, multi-million dollar companies started turning to liberal arts majors to help solve their biggest problems. Uber needed psychology majors to help deal with unhappy riders and drivers. You know, a technology person might not be able to manage that, but someone who's read a million books and seen problems solved again and again, and a psychology major who's curious about how the mind works, what makes those people mad? Were they really mad to begin with? Or were they mad about their ride or were they mad because their husband drank too much that night? These are really um, important things to consider. And then open table, which I'm not sure if you have that um, app in um, India or not, but here it's a way of reserve, uh, reserving tables for a restaurant. It was hiring English majors to bring data to the restaurant owners to keep them excited about what data could do for their restaurants because what do restaurant owners know about how people are using these apps they're, they want to cook food, but they need to somebody to think for them, to help them to get their story out. And so there's tons of um, ways that the liberal arts mind can be um, brought into focus and brought into business and brought into growing the world and impacting the world and impacting business. Um, I just wanted to show you a bit about, um, hold on one second, yeah. About some of the areas where um, writing is used and the salaries that are earned. Copywriting, copywriting is something that's done in advertising. Um, content writing, that's story storytelling for business. I've done content writing for a hairdresser, for an experiential marketing company that was trying to harness the impact of experiential marketing on, on a business success. Um, there's all sorts of content that needs to be written beer companies. I'm trying to think of different, um, and a fraud investigation company that I worked for. I wrote content for their website um, to help people under, help employers understand um, that when an employee says they can't work due to an injury and they get insurance for that, that's fraud. And it costs not only that company, but uh, tons of other businesses over time. So I wrote the content for, for that. Um, there, there are all sorts of business people trying to do business, but they don't know how to tell their story and they need writers and people who understand words to do that. And they're willing to pay for that. Then technical writing is one of the most lucrative things you can do. So if you happen to be uh, liberal arts majors who also were sort of forced into studying engineering. Uh, technical writing is a great field. It's a it's a way you can do writing and also um, stay in touch with um, stay in touch with uh, the technical aspect. Grant writing um, is for um, that one I included and probably um, may not apply so much, but possibly it does for uh, NGOs, um, nonprofits, um, grant writing is a way to help them to gain money and funding. Uh, ghost writing, that's work I've done. And um, again, executive, I helped an executive who runs um, a company that trains, <laughs> trains, 
uh, Fortune 500 companies how to sell. However, the CEO could not write his own book, so he he hired me to help him as a ghostwriter to tell his story. So um, that's the sort of work that that happens on a regular basis. That um, people who can't write need people who can write, and they are, they're willing to pay for that. In medical writing, again, uh, for those of you who may have been compelled to be become doctors and found that you didn't want to be in the medical field, medical writing, or even not, just those who've studied um, the fields of medicine. That's a really lucrative um, area as well for writers. Um, but then if we take that one step further and talk about what we were talking about earlier, about thinking beyond writing and editing to the next level of harnessing those analytical skills, those management skills, those visionary skills. When you move to the next level beyond writer, beyond editor into the executive level, these, these give you some uh, indications of, and I don't know how old these figures are, but of the amount of money that can be earned as an executive in marketing communications. So you're not just writing, you're not just editing, you're not just the junior, you're the executive. The salaries go even higher. And um, if you look though in marketing versus technical writing, you can see that um, there, you know, there's some great money to be earned there as well. Great storytellers are highly successful in fields where they can, where they have influence. Advertising, sales, law. You have to convince a jury. If you, you have to convince a judge. It takes someone who has persuasive skills, psychology. Um, I had a great, great quote, I didn't include it here, that a psychologist doesn't care if you're telling the truth or a lie all that matters is the story. <laughs> so a, a psychologist is evaluating a uh, story and hearing story and comparing it. <clears throat> and then of course, education is a great field for storytellers as well. So with that, um, I wanted to say, I encourage you, um, I, you know, I'm coming up against um, to the end of what I had to say, but I wanted to say that um, I encourage you to live a full life and embrace everything about you and all those personalities that you wrote down. I really would encourage you to, you know, explore that further. Meet all the characters in yourself, in your books and in your life write about them, explore them, share them with others, analyze and compare them, be curious and live abundantly. And again, I, I'm just so grateful to have been here and for you inviting me. And I, um, I know that you may have some questions now, so I'd like to wrap up there and uh, I'll answer whatever I can. And if you have any other things you'd like me to talk on, I, I'd be happy to do that too. So I'll turn it back. Well, over. I could say, ma'am, it was really great. And we have our students, Pranch and Srividya here to ask you some questions. So before we throw the question round to the audience, um, we have some already pre-prepared questions for you. So sure. Pranch, can you start now? Okay. Prancha and Srividya will uh, also take the questions that you guys will drop in in the chat box for ma'am. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and maybe uh, I, I'm not sure. So, they, they wish you might not let others use their <laughs> microphones here. Okay. So, kindly drop in your questions for ma'am here mm -hmm. in the chat box as we move ahead with. So all Any of you are questions. requested to drop in a question. So Pranch and, and Shrevitya will turn by and read your questions and ma'am will answer them. 
Yeah, and we already have a question actually here. So, Prankshan, where are you? Prankshan, can you start with? We have something. Okay, yes, so, yes, Mark, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, so, ma'am. So, ma'am, before I take questions of others, I have my own question here. So, yeah. I like to put myself first here. So basically, uh, I want to know, actually get to know more about the difference because when we read literature, when we read literary texts, we tend to attach a personal meaning or a self meaning to a literary work mm -hmm. that might also result into a misinterpretation of the literary text. So how can we overcome this problem? Because we as a human being, we are going to attach a personal meaning to the literary text but it might also result in a, a sort of misinterpretation of the text. My first reaction, and this is not a scholarly reaction, is there is no misinterpretation of a text. When you read a text, it's just like seeing a piece of art. It may not be what the artist had in mind. It may not have be what the writer had in mind, but when it impacts you, then it's not a misinterpretation. Now, if you are confronted about that, if you are confronted by, in, uh, by your professor or by others about your interpretation, that doesn't make your interpretation invalid. It, it only means that you have uh, found your answer. <clears throat> Ma'am, so uh, before moving on to the audience questions, I wanted to ask you a question of mine. Okay. So the abundance that you describe in the literature and language offers us, so how do we navigate this paradoxical abundance? Because we as a generation are used to so many options and we usually, uh, you know, run, run astray with deciding to choose what to do and what not to do. <laughs> you know, this ab abundance has a paradox attached with it. You're absolutely right. You're 100% right. I wish I had the wisdom to tell you the answer to that, but um, there are a lot of forces. And I think one of the, one of the ways and the reason that I offered that, uh, that exercise of your uh, identifying your characters is because all of those characters are an abundance of a lot of voices in your head that are also influenced by your parents, by your peers, by um, society. And so how do, you, um, how do you sort that out? One of the ways that um, it is true, it's, it's not just true in uh, language and literature or making a decision of what do, what do I do now? <laughs> Um, it's true in what do I read this minute? What do I give my attention to? And it really um, takes some focus. And, and for me personally, that's all I can tell you because it's going to be a different answer for you is I write. I write to understand, even if it's making lists and I try to find my niche and um, I rule things out and I listen to myself. What really resonates with me? Now, again, sometimes the thing is like, even today, I was in some way um, offering an influence. Here's what's going to earn you more money, right? <laughs> but that may not be what makes you most happy. And so then you have to decide, well, what is more important to me, making more money or feeling more connected to myself and happier in my day-to-day -day life? It's not an easy question. And it's, it's a very good question that you have asked, but it's not an, there's not an easy answer, unfortunately. <laughs> but thank you for asking. Yeah. So we have, yeah, please go yeah. ahead, Prash. Yeah, ma'am, we have another question and you can actually see that it is from an English major student because of the technicality. His, uh, his name is Ash. He is asking how to keep literature away from politics, especially when it comes to canon formation. Yes, it is very technical. Thank you for that question. 
Um, again, I don't speak to this from a scholarly perspective. So um, I will say that that is an idealistic view that it cannot be kept away from political um, influence. It never has been. It uh, most likely never will be. Um, but it's a great pursuit. <laughs> and it's something to feel uh, a lot of strength in. If it's something um, more, more people are writing, just as writers are infiltrating into the business world and into the political arenas, into all sorts of areas of influence, advertising and all such things. By the same token, those same people are infiltrating into writing and into literature and into all sorts of um, things that they know nothing about. But, and it's weakening the classic um, canon, of, <laughs> if, you, if you were, but um, politics, uh, whether it's the politics of, um, Politics are not just what happened in government. Politics happen in science. Politics happen in in all areas. And um, you know, one thing I didn't talk about was for those of you who are majors and who are looking to publish, there's a whole world of politics in publishing. It's so political that, um, and it's so driven by marketing that, you know, Keeping it out of politics, it seems impossible to me. That's my opinion only, not my scholarly study. Okay, before he goes into um, you know more questions, I just wanted to ask something to you. So yes. it uh, for some time now, you are exploring flash flash fiction. Yes. Yes, and uh, if you could share your experience with it, uh, uh, you know, as in what how you were introduced to this area, what interested you, and how you are planning to take this forward. Because this is something, uh, you know, it's, uh, when, we, when we talk about literature, when we talk about uh, language, communication, there are, these are uh, very uh, tightly demarcated areas when we talk about that these things and when when people talk about literature then it comes to big and fat books and that is uh, you know uh, considered generally to be the sacred li literary text so how do you uh, you know what brought you to this uh, area mm, thank you for that question so you're absolutely right most people think of uh, writing in literature as um huge stories but um so for me, what, my first job in writing was in journalism. That involved writing short, short synopsis of very complex things and making the language so precise and getting it done. So the thought for me of sitting down, as I said, I would never want to be a novelist. It's not something that, uh, that works for my mind. I don't have a, a, an attention span that, that, or even the capacity within my mind to hold those characters and all that stuff at once. So for me, flash fiction was perfect. Um, I came to it because I started attending writers groups, groups with write, other writers. And so we would write for 10 minutes or 15 minutes on a topic. And by the time we were done, we, we were supposed to have a complete thought. We were not working on a long range project. And so that's how I first came to it. And when I wrote my first complete story and I'm like, the whole story is there. I could write a whole novel about this, but the whole story is there in, that, in those few words. Then I started to explore this further. And Ray Bradbury is one of the first to, um, who wrote this kind of, it has many names, microfiction, short fiction. Um, so it's been around for a long time and um, people in science fiction really um, 
like it, although um, I prefer the literary fiction myself. But as for going forward, I, and also even just plunging into it, in this technology age, I think that a lot of people are not willing to read long novels, or even if they do, they don't see the nuances of the, um, that happen. So um, flash fiction allows you to just, to just be in that moment, have that break in the day, and read that one story that might stay with you for, for months or years, depending on the writing. So going forward, I think um, uh, it's hard to tell how far this this will go. Um, I've been thinking myself of publishing um, some anthology, um, mm -hmm. either of my own work or of the work that I have published through my uh, Fewer Than 500, um, because I've been so grateful to um, have attracted writers from all over the world, award-winning global writers who have just shared their stories and some of them are just so impactful. And um, they just, every week, every day I get submissions. Some of them are no good, you know, and, uh, but that's my opinion. And then I find they get picked up by someone else. So, <laughs> so it's, uh, it's really an interesting work. Thanks for that question. I appreciate it. I could talk about something I really know for sure. <laughs> no, thank you so much, actually, because I have been wondering, in fact, I wanted to ask it, ask about like, uh, flash, uh, flash fiction, sorry for the slip, uh, to you even personally at times, because some of your stories that you've shared in fewer, in fewer than five, uh, 500, some of those stories have really stayed with me as well. You know, uh, oh, and Indian, and many of them will connect to it if you uh, follow Ma'am's website. There, you know, there was a story written by uh, almost an immigrant to the U.S., mm -hmm. and she just wrote about her first day in the New York City. It was a very short piece, mm -hmm. and uh, nothing. Uh, as such, nothing extraordinary, no extraordinary experience, but you know what she, uh, uh, you, can, you could connect what she was writing about because, you know, in this, uh, this is uh, what actually attracted my attention because she chose a very simple topic. In this world, we keep on moving for work, for, you know, personal reasons, maybe just for pleasure travel travel, anything. And she just choose, you know, what uh, the first day in an unknown place can look like. Mm -hmm. Generally, we don't, um, if, if she would have chosen to write on it, you know, in an elaborate way, maybe uh, the reader could have lost their interest. So yes, it, it, it does, uh, you know, this is just a uh, one of the stories that I remember, and it has really stayed with me when I came uh, to a different city to you know, work in a completely different environment, it really stayed with me. It was very simple, no hard feeling, nothing, just, you know, just a new environment and, and that was it. And it is, it, it, it actually explained what flash fiction is. <laughs> <laughs> it just stays with you. So yes, and I really feel uh, I know you'll be a, a better person one to uh, actually really. I think if, if people are aspiring to um, have a career in communications and if any field of communication, they are, it, it, it is also good for them if they try their hands in it. Yeah, I, yeah. can you just... Uh, anything on it because uh, you are a better person uh, with you know experience in so many fields of communication actually how writing could help a bit it's like short mm -hmm. writings or anything like right. their experience you know so did you um want me to say something about mm -hmm. about writing short fiction so I think one of the advantages, if you um, aspire to create writing, um, 
And I, I want to speak to this because of um, the previous question. As was mentioned in my bio that I started writing fiction, I had always only written nonfiction because I needed to express myself and I also needed to sort out what I thought. And what writing short fiction can do is it doesn't, you don't get to tarry there. Although you have to spend time and focused time to create um, some people do creative nonfiction, but the still the point is, it brings you to the point. You begin, you have to draw the reader in with some element of a plot, of a character, of all those things. It has all the elements of a story. And one of the things that it uses better than anything, and I think this develops language and, and writing, is negative space. So um, one of the, uh, I wish I could remember it by heart. There, there's, a, there's a flash fiction story and it um, shows um, an advertisement from a newspaper which says um, something to this effect, baby shoes for sale, never worn period. And that story in that you have to assume there was a baby that was expected, maybe born, you don't know the whole story, but maybe born. But now the shoes are there and someone has placed the advertisement in the newspaper to sell those shoes. So in that very short amount of words, the whole story is there because of negative space. And what negative space is just the things that you have to, the reader has to deduce in order to complete the story. So I think it involves your imagination and precision and brings you closer to the answer. So of whatever it is that you seek in the moment, which may just be um, something simple like, um, what do I think of this? political topic since that was, um, you know, politics or um, it could be, um, which is actually a bigger thing, but, but I think it brings precision to your writing and imagination and that focus on bringing your writer, bringing your audience, which is a key, key part of writing, bringing the audience into mind because you have to understand that they're going to have their own interpretation as uh, Pranchu mentioned, you, you know, they're going to bring their experience to the story. So how do you help them to understand the impact of what you're trying to say? It, it, there's so much in it compared to writing long descriptions of, which are beautiful uh, as well. But um, I love to read those. I don't like to write them. My mind works better to write shorter things. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Okay, we have some questions for you in the chat box. I'm sure you would you like to go ahead. Um, so she has one question for mom. Oh, Pranch is okay. Okay, I, I will read it out. So she is <laughs> with, uh, yes, with, uh, with uh, your, um, discussion on you know uh, the importance of growing importance of liberal arts education and the students she has one question for you being a liberal arts student we have a lot of options as you know i think she means that they study different subjects they are exposed to different mm -hmm. areas of education here so we may find it hard to commit to a single option or personality as a professional career. Mm -hmm. How do we choose when we are spoiled by abundance? <laughs> yeah, I think that's a very similar, yeah, a very similar question as asked earlier. You are spoiled by abundance. And um, again, it just, it's uh, all a matter of what speaks to you, what matters to you, what, and that is the key of what I have, I have 
talk about understanding yourself and understanding that you must be, be adaptable over time because you're going to change. As someone who's older than all of you, <laughs> I will say that um, one thing that I've learned to understand about myself, and I learned this through reading in the beginning, but I've learned it through living over time, is we live our lives in decades. The first 10 years of our lives were totally dependent on our parents. The next 10, um, 10 years of our lives <clears throat> from, our, from 10 to 20, we become a little bit of ourselves, but we become connected a little bit more to the outside world. And then from 20 to 30, we really become disconnected as much, not so much anymore, but <laughs> at least for in my case, disconnected from our parents and totally connected in the world and our profession. But then we're adults. And then what is going to make you happy at 30, at 40, at 50? And how do you see your life? You don't know. You don't know until you get there. So um, it's really important to be adaptable and to one of the reasons that studying, in my opinion, in the liberal arts um, helps you is because you can build on that education as you go and build. And um, this is not what I'm saying is not specific to the question because it really I can't answer for you what to do with that abundance except for it's really important that you do harness your own understanding of yourself and what you desire for your life and understand that it may not be what you desire for your life forever. <clears throat> Thank you, ma'am. And there's one more question, actually. Uh, one of our students is asking, what about the postmodern literature of exhaustion and literature of replenishment? Does that bring abundance as much as other forms of literature? It depends on the reader, <laughs> I would say. I, I don't, uh, honestly, I don't have an answer for that. I, I apologize. It's not, uh, yeah, it's a good question. It is a good question. Um, I'm going to read it from postmodern literature. <laughs> but I seriously think it really, really depends on the, uh, reader I, in fact uh, when we uh, I think we uh, discussed uh, you know though this is uh, about a modernist writer but uh, when we were uh, we had a discussion on Kafka once and and I would say that uh, uh, Kafka reading Kafka Kafka has a very dark world and not that everyone will be fond of Kafka's world, but I would say that um, his world brings abundance to me in the, in the, in the way that it uh, broadens, it, it broadens my perspective in a way. This is, I, 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 you may agree or mm -hmm. may choose not to, but again, uh, it limits for, for others. I have you know, discussed with a Kafka with people for whom Kafka actually uh, limits their uh, way of uh, thinking, they say, because of the, you know, extreme, uh, what should I say, negativity with the world around. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, it depends, it really depends on how you read it. If, if I am, uh, if you would like to add anything on it, you may please go ahead. But this is what I, I felt when, when I heard uh, about you know, this question. I think uh, your answer is sufficient. I honestly, I, it's, that one is a more of a scholarly, scholarly question that I don't really have a, um, because it depends upon the reader. How does it impact you? How does it, uh, if it doesn't, then I don't know that it, uh, it may not add to your abundance. You know what adds to your abundance. What, it, so um, for me, what adds to abundance is an open mind and a curiosity. 
if you're not curious about those forms of literature, then maybe you need to read them to understand them better. Um, or throw them aside. It's, it's totally up to you. Uh, it's a free world in that, in that respect. So I saw one question in the chat I just wanted to respond to uh, quickly, if you don't mind me selecting the questions <laughs> to respond to. Um, yeah, I, I want to say the name correctly. Uh, Himadri Patel has asked, yes, yes. Um, how in the world does literature have anything to do with law? <laughs> and uh, what I wanted to say is that um, the study of literature and language, specifically language, um, everything in law is very precise to language understanding what words mean, uh, crafting, uh, crafting things in legal documents that are 100% precise. And then on the level of, this is, more goes toward uh, litigation and courtroom litigation, but, um, and I know this only from working as a reporter and covering court cases, and this is in the, the US, so it may look different differently in India, but um, the best lawyers, the ones that get their clients what they're looking for are the ones who can tell stories. And so that's the answer to that question. I, I like that question, so I wanted to, to answer it and I hope it gets to, um, Someone she has another interesting question, uh, which we like to answer actually. That she is uh, writing that there are, uh, you know, if, if you could uh, give any tips for first time writers who really do not want to hire an editor and yet want to make their works error free. So you are asking this to an <laughs> editor. <laughs> and asking for her tips to not hire editors. <laughs> yes, <laughs> actually it was a very... That was serious. the trickiest part of your question, Madhuri. Yes. Yeah, ma yeah. Of course. Um, yeah, I, it's a I, thank you. And I, I did see that, that, okay, fine. You don't want to hire me. It's okay. That's fine. <laughs> I find a number of people who are like that. And there's a lot of options out there. I can't say that um, if you really want to create a manuscript that you want to uh, submit on a level um, for professional publication, then I will always suggest that you consider hiring a professional, but for in the instance that you're talking about a first time writer who's uh, creating work, one of the best ways in my opinion and my uh, is to get involved with a group of other writers, either online or person to person and share work, um, have other people and more than one read your work because each reader has a different um, different skill. And there are so many different kinds of editors. I should say this to you all um, because people think one editor is the proofreader, is helping to develop the content, is doing the fact checking. But in fact, if you're working with the publishing house for a novel, let's say, there's a different person to do all of those things. And when people hire me as an editor, they hire me as a developmental editor. And I tell them up front, if you need someone to make sure your commas are in the right place and that you don't have a word choice that's uh, you know, out, of, out of the rules, then you, you need to hire someone else to do that because I'm not a proofreader. That's not my skill set. And so, um, if you're working on your own and looking to hire uh, an editor for someone to help you develop your writing and to make it um, more clear, better organized, that's the type of work that I do with, with uh, writers. But then again, there are proofreaders. So if you want to um, um, 
to really get some help as you're developing your writing. I would say writing groups, working with other writers is a great way to do that. Thank you, ma'am. Very welcome. Thank you for the question. Uh, ma'am, one mean, question. Uh, okay, sorry. Yeah. Someone wanted. Actually, uh, I wanted to discuss that, like, uh, some of the works are there uh, in which uh, there would be the total pure words of the writer, for example, uh, Arundhati Roy's books like uh, uh, The Ministry of Utmost Happiness and all. So she uses her words in her own way, uh, like uh, breaks the grammatical rules and everything. So uh, I, I just wanted to ask that, is it really important to edit if you are perfectly confident about your work? Again, you're asking an editor that question. And so I'm going to say yes. I think that it is uh, because what I find is that often writers are very, very confident in their work, but readers have no idea what they're talking about. So it's important at least to have someone else look at your work. Um, Arendo Tiroy writes, uh, and many authors write in unconventional uh, usage, however their point comes across. The problem is when your usage and your point are not delivered effectively. So, um, but no, an editor is not the most essential part, as long as you are editing your work. But uh, if you want to succeed in traditional publishing, um, Self-publishing is its own thing, but if you want to succeed in traditional publishing, um, it's difficult. Writers have to be open to being edited because, um, because as other people have shared, and as I have said, when you're reading, you're reading from your perspective, not from the writer's perspective. So the most important person in, in uh, traditional publishing is the audience not the writer so that would be my response Pranchu you had Thanks, another question uh, yes See, I will um, uh, get in between I'm sure because just a second um, actually Bhakti had uh, you know asked one question maybe which can be relevant uh, to continue with the topic we were discussing on so she had mentioned uh, you know she had asked how literature can develop one's critical thinking skill. And since you were discussing um, editing and also they had one question for you, which they did not ask, is what is the difference between proofreading and editing? You know, so how, how uh, a student of literature can become a good editor. I am combining all their questions together. Uh, so, and how their knowledge and uh, education in literature can help them to become good, good at critical thinking and that can add up to their skills in editing as well. In, in editing as well. Okay. So um, hmm. let me try to, to unbox that because it's a big question. First, I'll start with critical thinking skills. Um, Critical thinking, in my estimation, as a topic um, or as a, a skill, is the ability to hold complex thought, the ability to, cons to have empathy, to consider all angles. And um, the way that literature helps develop those skills, and especially comparative literature, the work that you do in the classroom, I think, um, where you have different pieces of work and different thoughts and conflicting thoughts, and you have to bring those together to form a single thought, a single idea, a single persuasion, those sorts of practices. And even if you're not doing it in the classroom, the books you're reading, when you compare one author's style um, to another author's style or the characters or the protagonist, all those things, 
they're helping you to understand human beings or nature or whatever science, whatever it is you're reading about. Um, it's helping you learn to evaluate. Um, and so I think that's how critical thinking uh, skills are. Um, I think the another question was about what's the difference in an editor and a proofreader. Uh, a proofreader is a type of uh, does a type of editing, which is um, for grammar and usage. Uh, the way the language is used, does it fit a particular, uh, does it conform to the style? Does it conform to the, um, to the conventions of uh, appropriate English grammar and usage? And what is appropriate grammar, <laughs> grammar and usage? which style book is being used, which, um, you know, I edit works that are sometimes written in AP style, Associated Press style, sometimes in Chicago Manual of Style. Sometimes they're written um, according to British, um, British conventions, sometimes uh, English, American English conventions. So a proofreader is really focused on the usage of language um, in terms of grammar and that sort of things, things that you're taught in grammar courses primarily. Whereas um, there are there the other types of um, uh, editors are called line editors, those who go line by line in the book to make to do things like fact checking um to um make sure that every word usage is um is compliant and in the the style that it's being written it's not a lot different than proofreading but a little bit different and a lot of times a a, a, a line editor and a copy editor their functions are the same um i think there are about five different types of editors um, again, a developmental editor is the big thinker, the one who helps to organize. Um, I know the books that I've edited, a lot of times the writers will write in a, a linear fashion and I help them to reorganize so that the, fo that the thought is on um, or the focus is on keeping the reader engaged throughout the, the novel or the, the piece of work. So they're, they're um, in... And the next question was, how do you use all this knowledge of critical thinking to become a, a better editor? Um, honestly, to be a proofreader, you need to know, it, that's a tools game. You need to know the tools. You need to know your style manual. You need to know the, what the rules are and how and apply them. It's just like a hammer or nails. <laughs> that, that's what proof, proofreading is. But for a developmental editor or a content editor, those critical thinking skills are utilized to the nth degree because not only do are you thinking about the writer's voice, you're also thinking about the reader's mind, you're thinking about style, you're thinking about keeping engagement, you're thinking about storytelling, um, there's a lot of different things that come into play on the developmental editor side. Um, so I hope that answers all of those questions that were combined. <laughs> yes, uh, yes ma'am. Ma I think we can take a few more questions, last few more questions. Okay. Uh, one of them being that, does literature gives value to language or language gives value to literature? And when it comes to creating the art, how both of them actually works together? Mm, that's a really good question and one that I may not be wise enough to answer but I'll give it my best shot <laughs> would you repeat the question uh, yes ma'am when it comes to creating the art does language gives value to literature or literature gives value to language and how both of them actually works together one could not uh, one could not exist without the other um, and they both give value to the other 
Um, but if I put it in terms of an artist, uh, a um, visual artist, um, would you say that paint and color give shape to the painting or does the painting give shape to the color? It, it, it's almost a question that is, um, again, it, it goes back to the most important person in any uh, reception is the the person who is the observer, the reader, the um, so if you're a writer and you're creating literature, language is your tool. Just like I talked about proofreading, language is your tool for for telling your story, creating your content, whatever it is that you're doing. Um, if you think of literature as art, it's your sculpting tool. It's your it's your paintbrush. It's your it's um, words are the way that you shape the literature that you create and um, literature itself would not exist without words um, there there is no literature without words um, and words could just be floating out there i suppose but they don't have meaning until they're put into literature so I think that's how I would answer that. I, I hope it answers the question. Yes, yes, <laughs> it definitely does. does. We will take uh, just two questions because, uh, you know, we don't, uh, okay, there are so many questions coming in for you, <laughs> ma'am, but it is already 10 to 12 and actually you all have to go back to classes so <laughs> yeah so uh, so let's let's restrict it to two uh, questions and then uh, two maximum three questions not more than that so uh, yes shrividya you had one question i guess yes ma'am uh, because we have the chance to talk with you we wanted to like know and gain all your valuable insights so my question basically is, what role do editors have in, you know, highlighting the voices of people of color? What role do they have in magnifying the role that, you know, people of color have in the literary or editing space? This question I can answer from the perspective of a managing editor, someone who makes a decision about what is being published and uh, that sort of thing. The role uh, there is a conscious uh, decision to give voice to the voiceless, to give voice to people with varying opinions. I think one of the things that is most um, encouraging about where uh, language is um, as, as a canon, per se, literature, is that there are so many, there is an abundance of places to be published and, a, and, a, and to be read, and that editors in traditional publishing are beginning to see they have left out these voices over the years, but those voices have not been silenced because they found their own place. And, um, and now, they're now the traditional publishers are beginning to recognize the importance and the prejudice that they have exercised over the years by not including those voices. So the, the from the role of a managing editor, one who is deciding what Will be published for instance in my uh, literary journal i made a devoted effort to make it a global voice where voice and and when people write in their own um i worked with some other editors helped me for a while and they said no we have to change this this language to be not british english so it has to we're publishing in america no we're not publishing in america we're publishing in the world so publish the voice in the voice that it is spoken. And so I think that's the best answer I can give. <laughs> Thank you for that question. 
Actually, this is, uh, yeah, this is something that we are not really aware of. We read books, but we don't see the people behind the books, mm -hmm. apart from the author's name, actually. Mm -hmm. So, yes, uh, that was great. In fact, another question for, you know, the, uh, for the challenges of the editors are uh, here. Kushi is asking, so how do, how does the editors have settle their conflicts with authors? I'm glad that you picked that one. I saw it pop up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Um, <laughs> because authors often do become very upset with editors because they have worked so hard to create something. And they feel so good, which is why uh, I was responding uh, to Himadri earlier that uh, they feel so good about what they have written and then they'll turn it over and it, I will tear it apart and send it back and say, this is what needs to be fixed. And it, I have to sometimes empathize with them that they spend a lot of time I'm the editor, so I have a role too. I have a role to use language. I have a role to apply my knowledge. And so how do I work it out? I try to explain to them in the beginning, if you want me to make your writing better, I'll do my best. We don't have to agree. If you don't like what I've said, you don't have to change it. It's up to you. But it's important that it's a collaborative effort. I think, um, of so many, you know, there are so many great stories of editors and writers who've worked together over the years. And I have a, a writer that I've been working with for the last years and it's, um, it's a difficult navigation sometimes because one is not right and the other is wrong. It's just a matter of collaborating. And so um, I try to take every every client that I take on, I try to be honest with them and say, I'm going to give you my best answers and my best thoughts and challenge you to expand yourself. Um, but sometimes they don't agree. And so it's my role as an editor to say, this is your work. This is your work. If you feel that this is what you want to do, it's yours. I, I, it doesn't belong to me. I'm only trying to work with you to make it better. I saw one, I've seen two questions about distractions, so at least two and maybe three <laughs> for focusing. So I'd like to answer those just quickly if I can. And I know that you have to go, but I saw at least two or three pop up about how do you sit down and focus and, and get, uh, get focused. I follow a method called the Pomodoro method. P-O-M-O-D-O-R-O, -O, I think. It's actually an Italian word that I think means tomato, but uh, I'm not sure. Anyway, <laughs> I set a timer for 25 minutes and I, whatever happens in that 25 minutes, I do not let anything distract me. I put away my phone, I turn off all notifications and then I take a five minute break and then if I'm continuing on a specific project, I'll do that for a period of maybe three times. And um, that's a really effective tool for me for getting focused um, on writing because I do have to clear the room and I have to clear my mind to be able to write. So I relate to those of you who struggle in this distracted time. <laughs> yes, so actually, Arsh wanted to ask this question to you since long. So, yes, here you go, Arsh, and many others actually. <laughs> there are some aspiring writers, there are some who do write and are looking forward to publish their words. And there are others who read a lot. And so it helps all of them. And uh, yeah, so, Thank you very much for uh, you know, delivering such an enlightening lecture to us. Ziba and uh, Jenna, Jenna, they wanted to uh, 
thank you formally on behalf of the school mm -hmm. before we wrap up the session. They are our students. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, we've been so engrossed in this session that we hardly realized how the time flew by. And honestly, today I learned so much uh, and it was more like a spiritual session for me because I got to learn so much and introspect back on my reading. And it has been so amazing and we wish that we could hear you for some more time. We, like, I really want to, for the session to continue and take up all the questions and like pour our hearts out and ask you everything we want. And I'd like Jana to share her experience. She has a lot to say from her side too. Thank you so much, Siva. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for such an informative session. So uh, I have uh, like noted a few points of yours, which personally I and I think everybody here may have felt relatable with. So when you told that uh, when you read a single book multiple times, you tend to uh, pay attention to different things which went unnoticed the first time. I would really uh, agree with that because um, I have experienced like when I read, uh, I have a few favorite, not a few, like a bundle of favorite books, which I keep on reading them multiple times. And every time I read them, I discover a new thing, a new, I tend to pay attention to a character which went unnoticed the first time out of the first few times. And yeah, it gives a, a really good feeling that uh, I am able to cover all the parts of the book when I read it a multiple times. It also uh, gives, it helps you discover your voice. Mm -hmm. And the, another point uh, that you uh, mentioned was it broadens your imagination. I think every reader and writer here believes that reading uh, broadens your imagination as it is said that a reader lives a thousand times so yeah i love that point and i totally agree with that mm -hmm. thank you for really such thank you for the, for the way you have argumented our perception about literature and we really await another session with you thank you i'm so jenna and Zeva. <laughs> Yes, before you all go, actually, uh, before you all go please, away, please, I really you. want to switch on your cameras and let's have a picture together. At least let's have a picture virtually together. And ma'am, we'll really love to invite you to our campus someday when everything Yes, open. actually, this is what I wanted to share with you. So some of many of my colleagues were also here. Now they and most of them had to uh, move away because they have our, they have their classes. Um, starting from 12. Preeti Das, she is the additional director of the school. She has dropped a message for you that uh, which you can see and she uh, has mentioned there that once we are open, she would love to have you on campus for a workshop with the students. So yes, we are looking forward to positive days ahead. And thank you all, everyone, students, my colleagues here, we had many of my colleagues here attending your lecture. Um, Anirvan, Swatashwini, Chitra, Shraddha ma'am. I could, if, um, and I'm sorry if I've missed others, Preeti ma'am was here. And uh, thank you all for joining in. It was great to have you all in the lecture. And of course, thanks for accepting my invitation, ma'am, Rita. And it was, a lovely session with you. Looking forward to more, 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 more such sessions. And yes, Devrishi, let's take a photo together. Okay. We Three, leave the two, one. Everybody smile. Okay, I took one. One last thing before we go. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. You touched my heart. Thank you. It Thank was you. wonderful to be with you. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you in better times on your place. All right. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay, ma'am. Bye, ma'am. Bye-bye. Yes. So, thanks, guys. I really screwed up.
Jana, thank you for coordinating so well. We were like texting and voice sending voice notes thank to each you, other too. and calling her. No, but seriously, you guys did really, really well. well. <laughs> you guys did really great. Yes, we all did very well. So thank I'm you thinking so much. you have. Ma'am, please you bring more lectures. editors. I have so many questions. Editors. Yes. Oh, Zeeva, you can email uh, the questions to her. She said, yeah. like she mentioned I that she has that. mentioned she the dialogue. Yeah, I noted that. Yeah, she has. Also, ma'am, um, just one suggestion. Uh, I would like you to mention these guys for the for any events too, because they really handle it very good. So let's forward the names too. Yeah, sure. And All of you did a very well, Devrishi. Special thanks to, special thanks your, to Shubhit, actually. Yeah, yeah, he, he, you know. He handled he, my part. He did it up very well. <laughs> though your, uh, despite the network glitch, um, Thanks I don't guys. think so. It was a network glitch. I don't know why Zoom just kicked me out. Even I was host. No, I was Zoom scared. I, I was really scared because I'm not good with, with technology at all. I was completely dependent on Devrishi and then the host just kicked out of the meeting. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was scared, <laughs> I would say. and um, But it went well. It was not interrupted. Um, mm -hmm. so. And you guys were brilliant. Yes, and uh, Jenna, you really handled, handled it very well. Jenna and Seba, both of you, because uh, they were you know, preparing their whatever to talk about then and there as yes. uh, they wanted to include what ma'am has said in the lecture. So, yes. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. See thank you all you in everyone. class. Yes, thank you, everyone. Go to class for now. I think many of you have a 12 p.m. class. So, bye bye. Okay, ma'am. Bye, ma'am. Bye bye, ma'am. Bye bye, ma'am. Bye. Bye, ma